Gallic Wars by Julius Caesar Translated by Rex Warner Book 1 58 BC Descriptions of Gaul First Operations Against the Helvetii The country of Gaul consists of three separate parts, one of which is inhabited by the Belgi, one by the Aquitani, and one by the people whom we call Gauls, but who are known in their own language as Celts. These three peoples differ from one another in language, customs, and laws. The river Garonne forms the frontier between the Gauls and the Aquitani the rivers Seine and Marne, between the Gauls and the Belgi. The toughest soldiers come from the Belgi. This is because they are farthest away from the culture and civilized way of life of the Roman province. Merchants, bringing the influences which tend to make people effeminate, hardly ever go into those parts, and they are also nearest to the Germans across the Rhine, and are continually waging war with them. For the same reason the Helvetii are the bravest tribe among the Gauls. They too are in almost daily contact with the Germans, either fighting to keep them out of Gaul, or launching attacks on them in their own territory. That part of the country which, as I have said, is occupied by the Gauls, starts from the Rhone, and is bounded by the Garonne, the ocean, and the country of the Belgi. On the side where the Sequani and Helveti live, it extends up to the Rhine. It may be said to face north. The country of the Belgi, beginning at the Gallic frontier, extends as far as the lower Rhine and faces northeast. Aquitania starts at the Gironde and extends up to the Pyrenees and the ocean west of Spain. It faces northwest. Among the Helveti at this time, much the richest and most distinguished man was a certain Orgetorix. This man aimed at making himself king over his tribe, and, during the consulship of Marcus Massala and Marcus Piso, organized a conspiracy among the nobility and persuaded the people to migrate from their territory in full force. It would be perfectly easy, he said, since they were the bravest of the Gauls, for them to conquer the whole country. His arguments were all the more persuasive because the Helvetii were, in fact, shut in on every side by natural geographical boundaries. On one frontier there was the broad and deep stream of the Rhine, separating them from Germany. On another, the high range of the Jura Mountains separated them from the Sequani while between them and the Roman province, on their third frontier, lay the Lake of Geneva and the Rhone. In these conditions their range of movement was restricted, and it was not easy for them to fight campaigns against their neighbors. This they greatly resented, since they were naturally fond of war. And they considered that their territory, measuring 227 by 170 miles, was too small for a people like themselves, so populous and with so lofty a military reputation. These considerations and the great influence of Orgetorix made the Helveti decide to prepare all the necessary arrangements for a mass migration. They were to buy up all the wagons and pack animals that they could, sow as much grain as possible so as to have adequate supplies on the march, and make treaties of friendship with neighboring states. Reckoning that they would need two years for effecting all this, they passed a law binding them to set out in the third year. Orgetorix was appointed to deal with these preparations, and he set out in person on a conciliatory mission to the neighboring states. While on this mission, he urged the Sequanian Custicus, whose father, Catamantaloides, had for many years been a king of the Sequani, and had been given by the Senate the title of friend of the Roman people, to usurp the royal power which his father had previously held. He also encouraged Domnarix, the Iduan, 
brother of Divitiacus, who, with the support of the great mass of the people, held the chieftainship at this time, to make a similar attempt at seizing royal power, and gave him his daughter in marriage. He assured both that there would be no difficulty in what he was suggesting. He himself, he said, would soon seize supreme power in his own state. There was no doubt that the Helveti were the most powerful people in Gaul, and he promised them that he would use his own army and his own resources to make them safe in their kingdoms. These arguments of Orgetorix proved effective. Promises were exchanged and confirmed by oath, and it was confidently expected that once they had seized the kingship of these three powerful and valiant nations, they would make themselves masters of the whole of Gaul. The conspiracy, however, was reported to the Helveti by an informer, and Orgetorix was told that, according to tribal custom, he must stand his trial in chains. If found guilty, the legal penalty was death by burning. On the day fixed for the trial, Orgetorix brought with him to the place of judgment all ten thousand of his retainers, together with a great many other tribesmen who owed him money or were bound to him in some way or other. With their aid he avoided the necessity of having to stand trial. The people as a whole, however, were angry at this evasion of justice. They determined to assert their rights by force of arms and the magistrates were already mobilizing large bodies of men from various parts of the country when Orgetorix was found dead. It was strongly suspected among the Helveti that he had taken his own life. The death of Orgetorix, however, made no difference to the determination of the Helveti to carry out their plans for the migration. When finally they considered that all their preparations were complete, they set fire to their fortified towns. There were twelve of these, four hundred villages, and all private dwelling houses. They burned all their grain except that which they planned to carry with them, so that with nothing left at home to encourage them to return, they might be all the readier to face the perils that lay ahead. Each man was ordered to take with him three months' supply of flour. They persuaded their neighbors, the Raraki, Tulingi, and Latubrigi, who were to join them in the migration, to follow their own example and burn their towns and villages. And they also took with them as allies the Boi, who had previously lived on the other side of the Rhine, but had crossed over into Austria, where they had attacked the town of Noria. There were but two possible routes by which the Helveti could leave their country. One was through the territory of the Sequani. It was a difficult route, with the Jura Mountains on one side and the Rhone on the other, so narrow that wagons could scarcely move along it in single file, and the high mountains that overhung the road would enable a mere handful of men to block the pass. The other route was through the Roman province. It was much easier and more convenient, since the Rhone, which flows between the territory of the Helveti and that of the recently subdued Allobroges, can be forded at various points. There is also a bridge at the Allobrogian frontier town of Geneva, which connects that country with the Helveti. The Allobroges were considered to be still disaffected toward Rome, and the Helveti felt confident that, either by persuasion or by force, they could secure a free passage through the country. So, when everything was ready for departure, they fixed a date on which they were all to assemble on the banks of the Rhone. This date was the 28th of March, in the consulship of Lucius Piso and Aulus Gabinius. On receiving the news that the Helveti intended to try to march through our province, I left Rome at once for Transalpine Gaul, and traveling as fast as possible, reached the neighborhood of Geneva. In the whole of Transalpine Gaul there was but one legion. I gave orders for the mobilization of as many more troops as possible and had the bridge over the Rhone destroyed. When they heard of my arrival, the Helveti sent a deputation of their chief man to me. The deputation was led by Namias and Verocloetius, and was instructed to say that their intentions in marching through the province were entirely peaceable. There simply existed no alternative route, and they asked me to allow them to do so without raising any objections. I remembered, however, 
that it was these Helveti who had defeated and killed the consul Lucius Cassius and sent his army under the yoke. It did not seem to me that any concessions ought to be made to such people. They were no friends of ours, and I did not believe that if they got the chance of marching through the province, they would refrain from acts of robbery and violence. However, it was necessary to gain time for the mobilization of the troops which I had ordered to be raised. I therefore told the deputation that I should have to consider the matter at my leisure. They were to return, if they wished to raise the question again, on the 13th of April. Meanwhile, I used the legion which I had with me and the fresh troops which had been enlisted in the province to construct a wall sixteen feet in height and a trench along the whole distance of eighteen miles between the Lake of Geneva, where it flows into the Rhone, and the Jura Mountains on the frontier between the Helveti and Sequani. When this fortification was finished, I posted garrisons at various strong points along the line so as to make it easier to repulse the Helveti if they should try to force their way through. The Helvetian deputation visited me again on the day I had fixed. I told them that I must act in accordance with the precedents and traditions of the Roman people, and was therefore unable to allow anyone to march through the province. I made it clear that if they attempted to use force... I would resist them. The Helveti had failed to get what they wanted. They now made a number of attempts, sometimes by day, but more often by night, at breaking through our line. Sometimes they tried to get across by means of boats and rafts, lashed together to form a bridge. Sometimes they forded the river at its shallowest points. However, they were faced by strong fortifications and by troops who concentrated quickly at the points of danger and poured a heavy fire on their attackers. In the end, they abandoned these attempts. The only road left to them was the one through the country of the Sequani, and this was too narrow to be practicable, unless the Sequani themselves were willing to let them use it. Acting on their own initiative, the Helveti failed to secure the necessary permission, and therefore they sent a deputation to Dumnerix the Iduan, asking him to use his good offices with the Sequani, so as to get this permission for them. Dumnerix was a man who carried much weight among the Sequani. He was personally well-liked and had spent money on increasing his popularity. He was also friendly toward the Helveti, for his wife, the daughter of Orgetorix, had come from their country. He was extremely ambitious to make himself king, was implicated in revolutionary activities, and wished to have as many states as possible bound to him by ties of gratitude. He was therefore very willing to take on this commission, and arranged matters so that the Sequani promised to allow the Helveti to march through their country. He organized an exchange of hostages to guarantee that the Sequani would allow the Helveti freedom of passage, and the Helveti would do no damage and resort to no violence while on the march. I now received information that the Helveti proposed to march through the territory of the Sequani and the Idui into the country of the Santones. This is quite near the frontiers of Toulouse a state in the Roman province, and I recognized that the province itself would be in great danger if this were to happen. It would mean having a warlike tribe, hostile to Rome, on a frontier which had no geographical defenses and which led to areas that were particularly rich in grain. I therefore left my deputy commander, Titus Labienus, in charge of the fortifications at Geneva, and went myself to Italy with as much speed as possible. There I raised two new legions, withdrew three others from their winter quarters near Achillea, and with these five marched back to Transalpine Gaul by the shortest route, which was over the Alps. While we were crossing the Alps, the Tsutrones, Graiocheli and Caturigis occupied various heights and attempted to prevent the army from getting through. We fought several engagements with them before driving them off. Seven days after leaving Ocellum, which was our last stop in Cisalpine Gaul, 
we reached the territory of the Vaconti in the Transalpine province. From here, we marched into the country of the Alabroges, and then on to the country of the Segusiave, who are the first tribe outside the province on the other side of the Rhone. By this time, the Helveti had marched with all their forces through the narrow passes of the country of the Sequani, and had reached and begun to pillage the country of the Aijui. Unable to defend themselves or preserve their property, the Aijui sent a deputation to me to ask for help. They claimed that their tribe had always been loyal to Rome, and that it was therefore not right for my army to be standing by inactive while their country was being laid waste, their children carried off into slavery, and their towns pillaged. At the same time, the Ambare, who are both kinsmen and allies of the Aedui, informed me that their fields had been laid waste, and that they were having the greatest difficulty in keeping their towns safe from enemy attack. Finally, the Alabroges, who had once owned property and inhabited villages across the Rhone, came to me for refuge, and told me that they now had nothing left except the bare ground on which their possessions had stood. All this convinced me that I ought to take action at once, and not remain inactive while the Helveti went on to the country of the Santones, destroying all the possessions of our allies on their way. There is a river called the Seon, which flows through the country of the Aidui and Sequani into the Rhone. The stream is so extraordinarily slow that when one looks at it, it is impossible to say in which direction it flows. The Helveti were in the act of crossing this river by means of a bridge of boats and rafts, and my patrols came in with the information that three quarters of them had already crossed the river, but about one quarter was still on the near bank. I set out from camp soon after midnight with three legions, and came up with that division of the enemy which had not yet crossed the river. They were hampered by their baggage, and our attack took them by surprise. We killed great numbers of them, and the rest took to flight and hid in the forests nearby. This particular division or clan, one of the four into which the people of the Helveti are divided, was known as the Tigurini. It was the same Tigurini who, about fifty years previously, had marched out of their country alone, killed and defeated the consul Lucius Cassius, and sent his army under the yoke. So, whether by chance or by divine providence, that section of the Helveti, which had inflicted such a terrible disgrace on Roman arms, was the first of them all to pay the penalty. In this action I had personal as well as patriotic reasons for rejoicing in the revenge which we took, since in the battle with Cassius the Tigurini had also killed his second in command, Lucius Piso, the grandfather of that Lucius Piso who was now my father-in-law. After the battle, I had a bridge built over the Seon, and brought the army across, so as to be able to pursue the remainder of the Helvetian forces. My sudden appearance had a disturbing effect upon the enemy when they observed that the business of crossing the river, which had caused them much trouble, and over which they had taken twenty days, had been done by us in the space of a single day. They sent a deputation to me which was led by Divico, who had commanded the Helvetian forces in the campaign against Cassius. The representations he made were as follows. If Rome would make peace with the Helveti, then the Helveti would go and settle wherever I decided that I would like them to be. If, on the other hand, I proposed to continue to treat them as enemies— I would do well to remember the traditional bravery of the Helveti, and how Rome had suffered on a previous occasion. It was true that I had made a surprise attack on one of their clans at a time when the rest of them, who had crossed the river, were not able to come to the help of their comrades. But it would be unwise for me, on the basis of this incident, to overrate my own strength or despise theirs. The Helveti had learned from their fathers and their ancestors to fight with courage rather than with guile or recourse to stratagems. I was therefore advised to think again and to avoid acting in such a way that this place where we parlayed might become famous in history for a disaster to the Roman people and the destruction of one of her armies. 
I replied as follows. As a result of what you have said, my mind is more firmly made up than ever. I remember well the events to which you refer, and I bitterly resent the misfortune which we then suffered, because we had done nothing to deserve it. If we had known that we had injured you in any way, it would not have been difficult for us to have taken the necessary precautions. As it was, we were deceived. We were not aware that we had done anything to give us cause for alarm, and it is not our way to feel alarm without good reason. But even if I were prepared to overlook these old insults, how could I forget the injuries which you have inflicted on us just recently? You attempted, after having been refused permission by me, to force your way through our province. You have robbed and made war against the Aidui, the Ambari, and the Alabroges. You may be insolent enough to boast of your victory and to preen yourselves for having escaped so long the punishment due you. Yet these facts point to one and the same conclusion. When the gods wish to punish wicked men for their crimes, they often allow them for a time a more than usual prosperity and an even longer impunity, simply so that they will suffer all the more bitterly when their fortunes eventually are reversed. Nevertheless, I am still willing to make peace on the following conditions. You must give me hostages as a security that you will do what you promise, and you must pay reparations for the damage you have done to the Aijui, the Alobrogis, and their allies. Divico replied that the Helveti, throughout their long history, had always been accustomed to take, never to give, hostages. And this, he added, the Romans knew well enough. With these words, he went away. End of the campaign against the Helveti. Next day the Helveti moved camp, as did I. Our whole cavalry force, consisting of about 4,000 men raised from all parts of the province, from the Aidui and from their allies, was sent on ahead to observe the enemy's line of march. They followed up the enemy rearguard rather too eagerly, and, joining battle with the Helvetian cavalry on ground that was unfavorable, suffered a few casualties. The Helveti were much elated by this engagement, having routed so many of our cavalry with a mere five hundred of their own. Their morale improved, and their rear guard would often halt and challenge us to make another attack. However, I kept my men back from fighting. We had enough to do for the moment in preventing the enemy from foraging and looting and generally devastating the countryside. So, for about a fortnight, the two armies moved on, the enemy's rear guard and our vanguard always within five or six miles of each other. Meanwhile, I was constantly urging the Aidui to send the grain which their government had promised me. Gaul, as already stated, is a northern country, and because of the cold, the grain in the fields was still not ripe, nor was there even an adequate supply of food for the animals. Moreover, I was no longer able to rely, as before, on the supplies of grain which were brought up the Seon in boats, because the Helveti had moved away from the river, and I did not want to lose contact with them. Day after day the Aidui kept putting things off, saying that the grain was being collected, it was actually on its way, it would arrive at any moment, and so forth. I realized that these postponements were going on indefinitely, and we were not far from the day on which the troops should be issued their rations. So I summoned a meeting of the Aiduan chiefs, of whom there were a great many in our camp. Among them were Deviciacus and Liscus, the latter of whom held the highest office in his state, being Vagobret, as the Aiduans called him. 
The Vergobret is an annually elected magistrate, with powers of life and death over his countrymen. I spoke severely to the Iduin chiefs, accusing them of being no help to me at all in this critical moment, when grain could neither be bought nor harvested, and when the enemy was so close to us. I pointed out that it was largely because of their entreaties that I had undertaken this campaign in the first place, a fact which made their betrayal of me even harder to tolerate. This speech of mine had its effect on Liscus, who now, at last, revealed some information which up to then he had kept secret. According to him, there were, among the Idui, certain individuals who had great influence with the people, and indeed were in their private capacity more powerful than the magistrates themselves. These men had been engaging in a criminal and seditious agitation designed to intimidate the people and prevent them from collecting the amount of grain due. Their general theme was that if the Idui themselves could no longer hold supreme power in Gaul, it was better to have other Gauls rather than Romans as their overlords, for they were convinced that if the Romans conquered the Helveti, their next step would be to deprive both the Idui and the other Gallic tribes of their liberty. It was these same people, Liscus said, who were in the habit of informing the enemy of our plans and of everything that went on in our camp. He himself could do nothing to control them. Indeed, he fully realized that in giving me this information, as he felt obliged to do, he had put himself into considerable danger and this was why he had kept silent for as long as he could. I felt pretty certain that the person to whom Liscus was referring was Dumnerix, the brother of Diviciacus, but because I did not want the affair to become the subject of general discussion, I quickly dismissed the meeting, asking Liscus to stay behind. When he was by himself, I put some more questions to him about what he had said at the meeting, and now he spoke with less restraint and more confidence. By secretly questioning various other people, I checked his information and found it to be correct. Dumnerix was the man responsible. Daring and unscrupulous, exceedingly popular with the masses because of his generosity, Dumnerix was aiming at a revolution. It appeared that for several years he had contracted to collect the customs and all the rest of the Iduin taxes. He had paid very little for this contract, simply because nobody dared bid against him. In this way he had become even richer than before, and had amassed large sums to be used for bribery. He went about with a large bodyguard of cavalry, which he maintained at his own expense. He was a man of authority, not only in his own country, but in neighboring states. And to strengthen this influence of his abroad, he had arranged for his mother to marry one of the most distinguished nobles among the Viturigis, had himself taken a wife from the Helveti, and had married his half-sister and other female relatives to men from various other states. Because of his marriage, he was strongly on the side of the Helveti, and he had reasons of his own for hating both the Romans in general and me personally, because one of the results of our arrival in the country had been the diminution of his power and the restoration of his brother Diviciacus to the position of honor and authority which he had held previously. He was convinced that if we were defeated, the Helveti would help him to become king, whereas if the country came under Roman control... He saw no prospects either of gaining the kingship or of keeping the influence which he had already. In the course of my inquiries, I also discovered that it was Dumnerix and his cavalry who were responsible for starting the flight of our whole cavalry force when it had suffered the defeat a few days previously. Dumnerix was the commander of the cavalry contingent that had been sent me by the Idui, and when his men had started to run away... Their panic had spread to all the rest. All this gave me good reason to distrust him, and the evidence was confirmed by other indisputable facts. It was Dumnerix who had arranged for the Helveti to go through the country of the Sequani, and who had seen that hostages were exchanged. He had, moreover, done all this without any orders either from me or from his own government, 
Indeed, neither I nor they had known anything about it. And now he was being accused by the chief magistrate of the Idui. It seemed to me, therefore, that I should be perfectly justified either in punishing him myself or in instructing his own government to do so. There was one objection, however, to following either of these courses. I had come to know Divikiakus, the brother of Dumnerix, well. He was entirely on our side, very devoted to me personally, and altogether a man who was quite remarkable for his loyalty, his fair-mindedness, and his good sense. I was afraid of hurting his feelings if I punished Dumnerix. Therefore, before taking any further steps, I summoned him to my quarters. Here I asked the regular interpreters to withdraw, and spoke with Divikiakus through the medium of Gaius Valerius Procillus, a leading man in the province and a great friend of mine in whom I had the most complete confidence. I reminded Divikiakus of what he had himself heard said about Dumnerix in the Council of Chiefs, and I went on to tell him of the additional information I had received about his brother from various individuals. I then most solemnly begged him not to take offense, but to approve of my suggestion that I should either try the case myself and decide upon the penalty, or else instruct the Iduin government to do so. Divikiakus threw his arms around me and burst into tears. He began to beg me not to be too severe with his brother. I know well, he said, that what you have told me is true, and no one is more sorry about it than I am. There was a time when, both at home and abroad, I had very great power, and Dumnerix, because of his youth, very little. It was through me that he grew great, now he is using the strength and resources which I gave him not only to weaken me, but practically to destroy me. Nevertheless, I feel for him as a brother ought to feel, and I must also consider the question of public opinion. I myself am known to be a friend of yours. If you take severe measures against my brother, everyone will believe that I was also in favor of them, and the result will be that I shall become hated all over Gaul. He was continuing to speak, still weeping and still begging me to relent. But I took him by the hand and told him reassuringly that he need say no more, making him see that I had such good will for him that I was prepared for his sake to do as he asked and to forgive both the injury done to Rome and the grievance which I felt personally. I then had Dumnerix brought in, and in the presence of his brother told him the reasons I had for being dissatisfied with his conduct. I informed him of the results of my inquiries, and of the complaints made against him by his fellow countrymen. I advised him to be careful not to give cause for suspicion in the future, and told him that it was only because of his brother Divikiakus that he was being forgiven for the past. After this, I had agents constantly on the watch, so that I could know what Dumnerix was doing, and with whom he was in communication. On the same day, my patrols informed me that the enemy had halted at the foot of a hill eight miles from our camp. A party was sent to reconnoiter the hill and find out what the ascent was like on the further side. They reported that it was easy. So, after discussing my plans with Labienus, my second in command, I instructed him to set out soon after midnight with two legions and climb to the top of the hill. He was to be guided by the men who had just reconnoitred the ground. An hour or so later I set out myself and marched toward the enemy by the same route as that which they had taken themselves. I sent the whole cavalry force ahead. In front of them were patrols under the command of Publius Concidius, who was supposed to be a first-class soldier, and had seen service under Lucius Sulla, and later under Marcus Crassus. By dawn, Labienus had occupied the summit of the hill, and I was not more than a mile and a half from the enemy's camp. As we discovered later from prisoners, the enemy had no idea that we were anywhere near. At this point, Concidius came galloping up to me and told me that the hill which I had wanted Labienus to occupy 
was in fact occupied by the enemy. He had recognized them, he said, by their Gallic armor and the crests on their helmets. I withdrew my troops to the nearest high ground and formed them up in line of battle. In order that the enemy should be attacked simultaneously on both sides, I had instructed Labienus not to attack until he could see my troops near the enemy's camp. So, after seizing the hill, he waited for us to appear and made no move himself. It was already late in the day when my patrols put me in possession of the real facts. That the hill had all the time been in our hands, that the Helveti had by now moved on, and that Considius had evidently lost his nerve and said that he had seen what was simply not visible. So, for the rest of the day, we followed the enemy with the usual interval between the armies and pitched camp three miles away from their camp. In two days' time, the troops were due to receive their rations. We were now not more than sixteen miles from Bibracte, which is much the largest and best supplied of the Iduin strongholds, and it seemed to me that something must be done to secure our grain supply. So on the next day I stopped following the Helveti and marched in the direction of Bibracte. This change of plan was reported to the enemy by some deserters from the Gallic cavalry commanded by Lucius Aemilius. The Helveti may have believed that we were marching away because we were frightened, and our failure to attack on the previous day, after which we had occupied the high ground, would support such a view. Or they may have thought that they could cut us off from our grain supply. Whatever the reason, they too changed their plans and altered the direction of their march. They began to follow us and to harass our rear guard. Seeing what was happening, I withdrew my forces to the nearest hill and sent forward the cavalry to hold up the enemy's attack. In the meantime, I formed up the four veteran legions in three lines halfway up the hill. Behind them, on the summit, were posted the two legions that had recently been enlisted in Italy, and all the auxiliary troops. So the whole hillside was covered with men. Meanwhile, I ordered the packs to be collected in one place, which was to be entrenched by the troops in line on the higher ground. The Helveti, with all their wagons, came after us. They deposited all their heavy baggage in one place, and then, fighting in very close order, drove back our cavalry and came on in a dense mass up to our front line. I first of all had my own horse taken out of the way, and then the horses of other officers. I wanted the danger to be the same for everyone, and for no one to have any hope of escape by flight. Then I spoke a few words of encouragement to the men, before joining battle. Hurling their javelins from above, our men easily broke up the enemy's mass formation, and having achieved this, drew their swords and charged. In the fighting, the Gauls were seriously hampered because several of their overlapping shields were often pierced by a single javelin. The iron head would bend, and they could neither get it out nor fight properly with their left arms. Many of them, after a number of vain efforts at disentangling themselves, prefer to drop their shields and fight with no protection for their bodies. In the end, the wounds and the toil of battle were too much for them, and they began to retire to a hill about a mile away. This hill they occupied, and our men pressed on after them. However, we were now attacked by the Boi and Tulingi, who, some fifteen thousand strong, had been the rear guard in the enemy's column of march. They now launched an attack on our exposed right flank and swept around behind us. The Helveti, who had retired to the hill, saw them go into action and themselves began to press forward again in a counter-attack. We formed a double front. The rear line faced about to meet the new attack, while the first and second lines went on fighting against those whom they had already defeated and driven back. This fighting in two directions went on for a long time, and was bitterly contested. Finally, when they could stand up to us no longer, one division of the enemy retired, as they had begun to do originally, toward the higher ground and the others fell back on the stockade, sheltering their wagons and baggage train. 
In the whole of this battle, which had lasted from midday until the evening, not a single man was seen to turn and run. Around the stockade, fighting went on far into the night. The enemy had drawn up their wagons so as to form a kind of rampart, and from this hurled down their weapons on our men as we came up, while others from underneath the wagons and between the wheels shot their native darts and javelins at us with damaging effect. It was a long fight, but in the end we gained possession of the baggage and the camp, and took as prisoners the daughter of Orgetorix and one of his sons. About 130,000 of the enemy survived the battle. They marched all that night without stopping for a moment's rest, and three days later reached the country of the Lingones. We had been unable to follow them, since we spent three days in looking after the wounded and burying the dead. But I sent messengers with letters to the Lingones, warning them not to give the Helveti food or help of any kind, and threatening, if they did so, to treat them also as enemies. Then, after the three days were up, I continued the pursuit, taking the whole army with me. The Helveti had now no supplies of any kind, and could therefore do nothing except send a deputation to discuss terms of surrender. Their representatives met me on the road. Flinging themselves on the ground before me in the attitude of suppliance, and with tears streaming from their eyes, they begged for peace. I told them that their army was to remain where it was until I arrived, and this order was obeyed. When I reached them, I demanded the surrender of hostages, arms, and those slaves of ours who had deserted to them. While the men were being rounded up and the arms collected, night fell, and about six thousand men of the clan called Berbigene took advantage of the darkness to slip out of the Helvetian camp and make for the Rhine and the country of the Germans. They may have been in a panic, imagining that once their arms had been given up, they were going to be put to death, or they may have hoped to get away safely, thinking that in such a vast number of prisoners... Their own escape might not be discovered at once, or might not be noticed at all. However, as soon as I found out what had happened, I sent out orders to the native tribes through whose territory the escaped prisoners had passed, and demanded that they should round them up and bring them back to me, unless they wanted me to regard them as accomplices in the escape. My orders were carried out, and the men were treated as enemies are treated." As to all the rest, I accepted their surrender once they had produced the hostages and given up their arms and the runaway slaves. I ordered the Helveti, the Tulingi, and the Latubrigi to go back to the lands which they had occupied before the migration started. Because they had lost all the produce of their land and had no means of subsistence, I instructed the Olabrugis to supply them with grain." The Helveti themselves were to rebuild the towns and villages which they had burned. My chief reason for taking these measures was that I did not want that part of the country from which the Helveti had come to remain uninhabited. It was rich country, and I feared that the Germans from across the Rhine might move from their own land into the land of the Helveti, and thus become neighbors of the Alabrogis and of Roman Gaul. As for the Bogi, who were known for their outstanding fighting qualities, the Idui asked to be allowed to settle them in their own country. I granted their request. The Idui gave them land, and later made them full citizens with the same rights and privileges that they enjoyed themselves. I was shown some documents written in Greek script, which had been found in the Helvetian camp. They turned out to be a complete list of the names of all those who had taken part in the migration and were able to bear arms. There were also separate lists of the children, old men, and women. The grand total came to 368,000 and was made up of 263,000 Helveti, 36,000 Tulingi, 14,000 Latubrigi, 23,000 Rauraki, and 32,000 Boi. There were 92,000 men capable of bearing arms. On my orders, a census was taken of those who returned to their homes, and the number was found to be 110,000. At the conclusion of the campaign against the Helveti, 
the leading man from nearly every state in Gaul came to me to offer their congratulations. They were fully aware, they said, that in this campaign I had been avenging wrongs done in the past by the Helveti to Rome. Nevertheless, Gaul had benefited just as much as Rome by the result, since the Helveti, when things were going perfectly well with them, had left their own country with the express purpose of making war on the whole of Gaul, and bringing it into subjection to them. Their plan was to select out of the whole great country some particularly fertile and convenient area for themselves to occupy, and to make the rest of the states pay tribute to them. The deputies then asked to be allowed to summon, under my sponsorship, a council of the whole of Gaul on a date to be decided. They said that they had certain requests which they would like to submit to me once general agreement had been reached. I gave them permission to do this, and they fixed a day for the meeting of the council. Each of them took an oath not to divulge its proceedings unless authorized to do so by general consent of all members. Ariovistus Preliminary Moves When this council had been held, the same tribal chiefs as before came back to me and asked to be allowed to meet me secretly for private discussions on a question which affected their personal safety and the good of the whole country. I granted their request, and at the interview they prostrated themselves before me and spoke with tears streaming. Anxious as they were, they said, to gain their requests, it was just as important for them that what they said should go no further. If it did, they would be likely to suffer for it most cruelly. Then Divikiochus, the Iduan, who acted as their spokesman, gave the following account of the situation. In Gaul, he said, there were two large factions, one led by the Aedui and one by the Averni. For many years these two had struggled bitterly between themselves for supremacy, until, in the end, the Averni and Sequani had hired German mercenaries to help them. Originally, about 15,000 Germans had crossed the Rhine, but soon these fierce and violent savages took a liking for the good land and the high standard of living to be found in Gaul, and many more crossed over. There were now about 120,000 of them in the country. The Aedui and their dependent states had fought in battle with the Germans over and over again, but they had been defeated with disastrous results, losing all their nobles, the whole of their national council and their cavalry. After these disastrous battles, the Aedui, who because of their own courage and the friendship and kindness of the Roman people had once been the most powerful state in Gaul, were now forced to hand over to the Sequani, their most prominent men, as hostages. They had been compelled to bind themselves by oath not to ask for the return of the hostages, not to seek help from Rome, and to submit permanently to the power and authority of the Sequani. I myself, said Divikiochus, am the only man among the Aedui who could not be induced to take the oath or to give up my children as hostages. It was because of this that I fled from my own country and came to Rome to ask the Senate for help, being the one man not bound by oath or by the knowledge that his children were in enemy hands. However, he continued, things had turned out even worse for the victorious Sequani than for the conquered Aedui. First, Ariovistus, the king of the Germans, had settled in their country and seized a third of their land, which was the best in the whole of Gaul, and now he was ordering them to evacuate another third. The reason for this was that several months earlier he had been joined by 24,000 of the Harudis, and he wanted to find land for them to occupy. Thus, in a few years, it seemed likely that all Gauls would be driven from their country, and the whole German nation would cross the Rhine. For there was no comparison between the land in Gaul and the land in Germany, or between the Gallic and German way of life. And ever since Ariovistus had defeated the armies of the Gauls at the Battle of Magetobriga, he had behaved like an arrogant and cruel tyrant. He demanded as hostages the children of all the Gallic nobles, 
and would inflict every sort of torture upon them if everything were not done precisely according to his will and pleasure. The man was a savage, incapable of controlling his passions or ambitions. It was impossible to put up with his tyranny any longer, and, as Divikiakus said, unless some help were forthcoming from me and from the Roman people, all the Gauls would have to act as the Helveti had done. They would have to migrate and find some other part of the earth, far away from the Germans, to live in, and they would have to take any risks necessary in order to do so. If, he concluded, Ariovistus ever hears a report of what I have said, I am quite sure that he will take the most dreadful revenge on all the hostages who are in his power. But you, Caesar, have the power to stop him. Your own prestige, and that of your army, the victory you have just won, the very name of Rome, could have the effect of preventing still more Germans from crossing the Rhine, and of saving the whole of Gaul from the outrages of Ariovistus. When Divikiakus had finished speaking, all those present began, with tears in their eyes, to beg me to help them. I noticed, however, that the representatives of the Sequani were an exception. Instead of acting like the rest, they kept their eyes downcast. I was surprised at this and asked them why they were behaving in this way, but they preserved the same sullen silence as before. I repeated my question several times, but still could not get a word out of them. In the end, Divikiakus the Iduan spoke again. The Sequani, he said, are in an even worse and more miserable state than the rest of us. They alone dare not complain or ask for help even in secret, since, though Ariovistus is far away, they fear his cruelty just as if he were present. The rest of us can at least find safety in flight. But the Sequani, who have admitted Ariovistus to their own country, and whose towns are all in his power— are exposed to every kind of torture that he may devise. After receiving this information, I made a short speech, in which I attempted to give the Gauls some encouragement. I promised them that I would look into the matter myself, and told them that I felt fairly confident that Ariovistus, in consideration of the authority which I held, and the kindness which I had shown him in the past, would stop behaving as he had done. After making this speech... I pronounced the meeting at an end. Now, in addition to what I had heard, there were many other reasons also which made me think that I must look into this matter and attempt to deal with it. First of all was the fact that the Idui had often been given by the Senate the title of friends and brethren. Yet now I saw that they were merely slaves under German authority, and I knew that Iduan hostages were in the hands of Ariovistus and of the Sequani. When I considered the greatness of our empire, I thought this a terrible disgrace both to myself and to Rome. I saw, too, that the Germans were gradually getting used to the idea of crossing the Rhine, and I realized that it would be very dangerous for us to have great numbers of them coming into Gaul. One could not imagine that these wild savages would be content with the conquest of the whole of Gaul, Instead, they would, as the Cimbri and Teutons did in the past, break out into our province and go on from there into Italy. As it was, only the Rhone stood between the land of the Sequani and the Roman province. To me, this seemed to be a critical situation, which must be faced at once. Moreover, Ariovistus had given himself such airs and had adopted an attitude of such arrogance that I considered him quite intolerable. I therefore decided to send envoys asking him to name some place halfway between us where we could meet for a conference, since I wished to discuss with him matters of state which were of the utmost importance to both of us. Ariovistus's reply was as follows. If I wanted anything from Caesar, I would go to him. If Caesar wants anything from me, then he ought to come to me. Also... I would not venture to go without an army into the part of Gaul that is occupied by the Romans, and the raising of an army would mean much trouble and much expense. In any case, I cannot understand what sort of business Caesar, or the Roman people for that matter, can have with my part of Gaul, mine by right of conquest. 
When I received this reply, I sent another deputation to him with the following message. You are under considerable obligations both to me personally and to the Roman people. You will recall that it was during my consulship that you received from the Senate the title King and Friend. I observe that you show gratitude for this by making difficulties about an invitation to a conference and pretending that matters that concern both of us are of no interest to you. I must therefore make the following requests. First, that you bring no more forces of Germans across the Rhine. Secondly, that you give back the Aiduan hostages which you now hold and authorize the Sequani to give back the hostages held by them. Thirdly, that you undertake to do no harm to the Aidui, and to enter into no hostilities either with them or with their allies. If you accept these terms, you can be sure that you will never lose the friendship and goodwill both of myself and of the Roman people. If you reject them, then I shall have to act in accordance with the decree of the Senate, passed in the consulship of Marcus Messala and Marcus Piso, which requires the governor of the province of Gaul to protect, consistently with the interests of the Republic, both the Aedui and other allies of Rome. I should not, in other words, be able to overlook the wrong which you have done to the Aedui. Ariobistus replied as follows, In war it is a recognized thing that the conqueror can dictate his own terms to the conquered. Certainly, Rome has always governed her own subjects in her own way, without waiting to be told what to do by someone else. And just as I am giving Rome no instructions about how to exercise her proper rights, so Rome should refrain from interfering with me in the exercise of mine. As for the Aedui, they took the risk of going to war with me and were defeated in battle. They now pay tribute to me, and your arrival has done me considerable harm since it has resulted in a loss of revenue to me from this source. I shall not give back their hostages to the Aedui, but I will not make war without good reason on them or on their allies, so long as they abide by their agreement and pay their taxes every year. If they fail to do so, they will find that their title, Brethren of the Roman People, will not be of the slightest use to them. You threaten me with not overlooking the wrongs done to the Aedui. Let me tell you that so far no one has made war on me without being destroyed. You may attack whenever you like. You will then discover what can be done by the valor of German soldiers who have never been conquered in war, who are perfectly trained in arms, and who for fourteen years have never sheltered beneath a roof. Just at the time I received this message... Deputations arrived from the Aedui and the Treveri. The Aedui came to complain that their country was being devastated by the Harudes, who had recently been brought across the Rhine into Gaul, and said, too, that even after giving up still more hostages, they had been unable to buy peace from Ariovistus. The Treveri reported that a hundred clans of the Suebi, led by the brothers Nasua and Kimberius, were encamped on the far bank of the Rhine, and were trying to get across. This news was extremely disturbing, and made it clear to me that I must act fast, since if this new band of Suebi joined up with the existing forces of Ariovistus, it would not be so easy to stand up to them. I therefore made arrangements for the grain supply as quickly as possible, and set out, marching by forced marches in the direction of Ariovistus. We had been on the road for three days when I was informed that Ariovistus, with his whole force, was moving against Besançon, which is the largest town of the Sequani, and that he had already advanced a three days' march from his own frontier. It seemed to me that I must do everything possible to prevent him from occupying the place. Besançon was an arsenal, filled with military materiel of all kinds, and it had such strong natural defenses that whoever held it would be in an excellent position for prolonging a campaign. It is almost completely surrounded by the river Dubes, which winds around it in a circle that might have been made by compasses. The gap in this circle is not of more than sixteen hundred feet, and is closed by a high hill, which on each side slopes right down to the banks of the river. 
There are fortifications all around the hill connecting it with the town and making the hill itself into a kind of citadel. Marching both by day and by night, I hurried on to this place, occupied it, and posted a garrison there. We then halted for a few days in the area while grain and other supplies were brought in. During this time, our troops began to ask questions about the Germans from the Gauls and the traders who were in the neighborhood. They were told that these Germans were people of prodigious size, incredibly fine soldiers, and extraordinarily well trained. The Gauls, so they said, had had frequent experience of them in battle, and found that it was impossible even to stand up to the fierce, keen look in their eyes. The result of these conversations was that the whole army fell into such a state of panic that almost everyone seemed to become more or less insane. The trouble started with those temporary officers and officials who had come out from Rome in order to cultivate my friendship, and who were rather lacking in military experience. Many of these people now began asking me for leave, each finding some excellent reason why it was necessary for him to go. Others had rather more self-respect, and, not wanting to look as though they were cowards, stayed behind. All the same, they could not control the expressions on their faces, and sometimes even burst into tears. They hid themselves away in their tents, where they spent the time bewailing their fate, or else commiserating with their friends about the terrible danger in which they all stood. All over the camp, people were making their wills and getting them signed. The panic and the general conversation of these people gradually began to have a disturbing effect, even on others with considerable experience in the army, soldiers, centurions, and cavalry commanders. Some of these, who did not want to appear as frightened as they were, declared that they were not at all afraid of the enemy. It was rather the narrow routes and the great forests between us and Ariovistus which gave cause for anxiety, or else the question of the grain supply and the possibility of a failure in its delivery. Some actually told me that when I gave the order to strike camp and advance, the soldiers would not obey orders and would be too frightened to move. When I saw how things were, I summoned a meeting of officers and ordered centurions of all grades to be present. I began by reprimanding them severely for imagining that it was any business of theirs to discuss or even to think about where they were being led or for what reasons. Ariobistus, I said, showed himself during the period of my consulship remarkably anxious to be on good terms with Rome. What reason now has anyone for supposing that he will be so foolhardy as to evade his obligations? Personally, I feel sure that when Ariobistus realizes what I am asking from him, and sees how fair my proposals are, he will not reject the offer of my goodwill and that of the Roman people. If, on the other hand, he were to go off his head and be insane enough to make war, what, may I ask you, have you got to be frightened about? What makes you downhearted? Is it your own lack of courage? Or is it my incapacity as a general? We had experience with this enemy in our father's time, when the Cimbri and Teutons were defeated by Gaius Marius, and it was generally agreed that the army deserved as much credit as the general for the victory. We recently met the same enemy again in Italy during the revolt of the slaves, and on that occasion they had the advantage of the discipline and training which they had learned from us. This slave revolt, incidentally, is a good example of what courage and resolution can do. For a long time, while these slaves were unarmed, our men had been needlessly frightened of them. But in the end, though they had won victories and furnished themselves with arms, we defeated them. Finally, these Germans are the same people whom the Helvetii have often fought and very often defeated, both in Germany and in their own country. Yet the Helvetii could not stand up to our army. Some of you seem to have been disturbed by the defeat and rout of the Gauls, yet if you look into the matter, you will find that the facts were these. The Gauls had become exhausted by the length of a campaign during which Ariovistus, for month after month, had kept to the shelter of his camp or of the marshes without giving them a chance of engaging him. It was only when they had given up all hope of meeting him in battle and had allowed their forces to become dispersed 
that he suddenly made an attack on them and won a victory that was the result of intelligent generalship rather than of superior prowess. Against inexperienced native troops there was certainly room for generalship of this sort. But not even Ariovistus himself can imagine that our armies can be taken in by such tactics. As for those of you who are hiding your own cowardice behind a pretended anxiety about the grain supply, or about the narrow passes on the route, let me tell you that you are acting in an extraordinarily arrogant way. Your view seems to be either that I am incapable of doing my duty, or else that I have to be instructed in how to do so by you. In fact, these matters are my own concern. Grain is being brought in by the Sequani, the Lucchi, and the Lingonis. The crops in the fields are already ripe. As for the route before us, you will soon be able to see what it is like for yourselves. I have been told that the soldiers will refuse to obey orders to advance. Such a statement leaves me completely unmoved. I know that in all cases where an army has failed to obey its general, this has happened because of some misfortune brought on by the general's incompetence, or else because some crime of the general's has been discovered and he has been convicted of avarice. In my own case you can look at my whole life for evidence of my integrity, and you can recall the Helvetian campaign for evidence of my fortune in war. I shall therefore now take a step which previously I had intended to postpone for a few days. We shall strike camp between 3 and 6 a.m. tomorrow. In this way, I shall soon find out which are the stronger motives with you, a sense of duty and honor, or sheer panic. And even if no one else will follow me, I shall still go forward with only the Tenth Legion. I have no doubts of the loyalty of that legion, and I shall have it as my bodyguard. I had always shown a particular affection toward the Tenth, and had complete confidence in the courage of its men. My speech had a remarkable effect. There was a complete change of heart, and now everyone was eager to go into action at once. First of all, the soldiers of the Tenth asked their officers to convey to me their gratitude for the high opinion I held of them, and to assure me that they were ready for battle whenever I wanted. Then the other legions, through their officers and senior centurions, sent messages to me in order to excuse or explain their conduct. They had never, they said, felt any doubt or fear, and they fully realized that the strategy of the campaign was the general's business and had nothing to do with them. I accepted these explanations. The route had been explored by Divikiacus, whom I trusted more than any other Gaul, and he had found that by making a detour of more than fifty miles, it was possible to march through open country. We started at about three a.m., as I said we would do, and after marching continuously for six days, were informed by our scouts that Ariovistus and his army were about twenty-two miles away from us. The Defeat of Ariovistus When Ariovistus heard of our arrival, he sent a deputation to say that he was now quite ready to accept my previous proposal for a conference, since I had come nearer to him, and he felt that it was safe for him to comply with my request. I did not reject his offer. Indeed, I thought that he was now coming to his senses involuntarily suggesting to do what he had refused when asked, and I was full of hope that in return for all the kindness he had received from me and from the Roman people, he would adopt a less obstinate attitude when he understood what I wanted from him. It was arranged that the conference should be held five days later. Meanwhile, messengers frequently passed between us. Ariovistus stipulated that I should not bring any infantry with me to the conference. He was afraid, he said, that I would surround him by some trick or other, and proposed that each of us should come attended only by a mounted escort. Otherwise he would not come at all. On my side, I had no wish for the conference to be broken off simply because of some such excuse— at the same time, I did not want to entrust my personal safety to a body of Gallic cavalry. 
I decided that the best thing to do was to take horses from the Gallic troopers and give them as mounts to soldiers of the 10th Legion, whom I could trust absolutely. So if there were any need of action, I should have as devoted a bodyguard as I could wish for. While this order was being carried out, one of the legionaries remarked rather wittily, Caesar's doing better than he said. He promised that the tenth would be his bodyguard, and now he's knighting us. The place where we had arranged to meet was a fairly large mound of earth in the middle of a great plain, and about halfway between our two camps. When we reached the place, I halted my mounted legionaries about two hundred yards away, and Ariovistus halted his own cavalry escort at the same distance. Ariovistus demanded that our conference should be held on horseback, and that each of us should bring with him ten horsemen. When we met together, I began my speech by reminding him of the kindnesses he had received from me and from the Senate. He had been given by the Senate the titles King and Friend, and he had also received a number of magnificent presents, a very rare privilege indeed, as I pointed out to him, and one usually reserved only for those who had done great personal service to Rome. Yet he, without any proper right even to be received by the Senate, and with no real reason for making any petition, had been rewarded as I had mentioned. He owed these rewards entirely to my generosity and that of the Senate. I then explained to him that the alliance between us and the Aedui was of long standing and was based on principles of justice. I told him of the many senatorial decrees which had been passed to do honor to the Aedui and informed him that even before they had asked for our friendship, they had always been the chief state in Gaul. It is the way of Romans, I said, to want our friends and allies, rather than lose what belongs to them, to be constantly growing in influence, importance, and prestige. Certainly we cannot tolerate a state of affairs where they are stripped of what they already possessed at the time they became our friends. In conclusion, I repeated the demands that I had sent to him before by messengers. He was not to make war on the Aedui or on their allies. He was to give back the hostages, and though it might be impossible to send back home any of the Germans he had with him, he must at least undertake not to allow any more of them to cross the Rhine. Ariovistus, in reply, said very little about these demands of mine, and a great deal about himself and his superior abilities. It was not, he said, on his own initiative that he had crossed the Rhine. He had come in answer to a summons from the Gauls themselves, who had invited him into their country, and it was only because he had reckoned on securing great rewards that he had left his own home and his own people. The lands which he now occupied had been granted to him by the Gauls themselves, who had also freely given him the hostages which he held. As for the tribute which he took, that came to him by the natural law of war which allows the conqueror to impose his terms on the conquered. Moreover, in his war with the Gauls, it was the Gauls, not he, who were the aggressors. All the states in the country had combined and brought up their forces against him. In one battle he had overpowered and defeated them. If they wanted to try the same experiment again, he was prepared to fight it out. But if they wanted to enjoy peace, they had no right to refuse to pay the tribute which up to now they had paid willingly enough. He considered that the friendship of the Roman people ought to be not only an honor, but also of some use to him, and it was in this belief that he had sought it. Certainly it ought not to do him harm, and if because of Rome he was to receive less tribute than before, or have to give up people who had surrendered to him, then he would reject Roman friendship as energetically as he had once asked for it. As for the great numbers of Germans whom he was bringing across the Rhine, this was not a move aimed against Gaul, but was purely a measure of self-defense, as could be proved by the fact that he had only come to Gaul because he had been invited, and that in war he had resisted attacks but never initiated them. He then claimed that he had come to Gaul before the Romans. 
Up to this time, he said, no Roman army had advanced beyond the frontiers of the Roman province of Gaul. What then did I mean by coming into country which belonged to him? This part of Gaul was his province, just as the other part was ours. If he were to invade our territory, we should rightly object. And just in the same way, we had no right whatever to interfere with him in an area which was under his control. As for what I had said about the Aedui being called brethren by the Romans, he was not such an uncivilized barbarian as to be ignorant of the fact that the Aedui had given Rome no help in her recent war with the Allobroges, and had received none from us in their own quarrels with himself and with the Sequani. He was bound, therefore, to suspect that all I said about friendship was a mere ruse, and that my real reason for having an army in Gaul was so as to use it in order to destroy him. And, he concluded, unless you take yourself and your army away from this part of the country, I shall treat you not as friend, but as an enemy to be hunted down. There are many members of the nobility and many leading politicians in Rome who would be extremely glad to hear that you had been killed by me. This is a fact I know for certain, because they have sent their own agents to tell me that I can count on their gratitude and friendship if I get rid of you. If, however, you go away and leave me in undisputed possession of Gaul, I will reward you handsomely, and if you want any wars fought, I will see that they are all won for you without your having to take any risks or undergo any hardships." I then spoke to him at some length, explaining that it was impossible for me to go back on what I had undertaken to do. It was against my principles and against the principles of the Roman people to desert allies who had proved their loyalty. I could not agree that Gaul belonged to him more than it did to us. I pointed out that the Arverni and the Ruteni had been defeated in war by Quintus Fabius Maximus, and had then been pardoned by the Roman people, who had neither formed them into a province nor imposed a tribute on them. If the question of sovereignty in Gaul was to be judged by the standard of who was there first, then our claims were the most just, and if the judgment of the Senate were to be upheld, then the country ought to be independent, since the Senate had decided that although Gaul had been conquered, it should continue to be governed by its own laws. While the interview was proceeding along these lines, I was informed that Ariovistus's cavalry were drawing nearer to the mound, riding up quite close to our men, and hurling stones and javelins at them. I broke the conversation off and went back to my men. I instructed them not to throw a single javelin back in reply, for though I could see that absolutely no risk was involved in a fight between picked legionaries and this German cavalry, I still did not want to take any action which would result in its being said, after the enemy had been defeated, that I had broken my word and lured them into an ambush during a conference. But when the rank and file of our army got to know how arrogantly Ariovistus had behaved at the conference, how he had told us to clear out of Gaul, how his cavalry had attacked ours, and so put an end to the discussions, the men were much keener than before, and still more eager for battle. Next day, Ariovistus sent envoys to me to say that he would like to reopen the negotiations that had been interrupted. He asked me to name a day for meeting again, or, if I preferred, to send him one of my senior officers. Personally, I could see no good reason for holding another conference, especially as on the previous day Ariobistus had been incapable of stopping his men from hurling javelins at us, and I thought it would be too risky to send him one of my staff officers. It would be like throwing him to a lot of savages. The best plan seemed to be to send Gaius Valerius Procillus, son of Gaius Valerius Corburus, who had been given Roman citizenship by Gaius Valerius Flaccus. He was a highly educated young man and a fine soldier. He was thoroughly reliable and knew the Gallic language which, from long practice, Ariobistus too could speak fluently. Moreover, 
In his case, the Germans could have no motive for doing him any harm. I sent with him Marcus Metius, who had at one time been entertained by Ariovistus. Their instructions were to find out what Ariovistus had to say and report back to me. But as soon as Ariovistus saw them in his camp and approaching him, he shouted out in front of his whole army, What are you here for? Spying, I suppose? And, refusing to allow them to speak, he had them thrown into chains. On the same day he moved forward and camped on the lower slopes of a hill about six miles away from us. Then, on the following day, he led his forces right past our position and camped two miles beyond us. The object of this maneuver was to cut us off from the grain and other supplies that were being brought up from the country of the Sequani and the Aijui. For five days running, I led my troops out of camp and kept them formed up in line of battle, giving Ariobistus every opportunity to fight a general engagement if he wished to do so. During all this time, Ariobistus kept his main forces confined to their camp, though engagements between the cavalry took place daily. As regards cavalry fighting, the Germans were specially trained in methods of their own. They had six thousand cavalrymen, who went into battle accompanied by an equal number of foot soldiers. The latter, particularly good runners and remarkable for their courage, had been chosen out of the whole army, each cavalryman picking his own infantrymen to look after him. When the cavalry were in difficulty, they fell back on this body of infantry, and the infantry would quickly concentrate. The foot soldiers would rally round any horseman who was wounded and had fallen from his mount. Long training had made them so fast on their feet that, in a prolonged advance or a quick retreat, they could keep pace by running alongside the horses and clinging to their manes. When I saw that Ariovistus was staying in his camp, I had to make a move to prevent myself from being cut off any longer from supplies. I selected a good place for a camp about six hundred yards away from the German position, and marched there with the army drawn up in three lines. The first and second lines were ordered to stand by under arms, while the third line built the fortifications for the camp. The place was, as already stated, only six hundred yards away from Ariobistus, and he sent out against us about sixteen thousand light troops and all his cavalry with the idea of frightening our soldiers and stopping their work. However, I kept to my original plan and instructed the first two lines to keep off the enemy and the third to complete the fortification. When the work was finished, I left two legions there and some of the auxiliary troops taking back with me the other four legions into the larger camp. Next day, as usual, I led out my troops, this time from both camps, advanced a little beyond the larger camp, formed up in order of battle, and gave the enemy an opportunity to engage. About midday, realizing that even now they were not going to make a move, I led the army back to camp. Then, at last... Ariovistus did send out some sections of his army to attack the smaller camp. Hard fighting on both sides went on until the evening. At sunset, after there had been a number of casualties on both sides, Ariovistus withdrew his men to their camp. By questioning prisoners, I discovered why Ariovistus declined to fight a pitched battle. Apparently, it was a German custom for the matrons to declare by means of lots and other methods of divination whether or not it would be a good thing to engage in battle. On this occasion, their verdict was that fate was against a German victory if they fought before the new moon. Next day, I left what I considered to be adequate garrisons in both camps and stationed all the auxiliaries in front of the smaller camp in sight of the enemy. I hoped that their appearance would make some impression on the enemy, since the actual numbers of the legionary troops were not very great compared with the numbers opposed to them. Then, with the army drawn up for battle in three lines, I advanced right up to the enemy's camp. Now, at last, the Germans were forced to action. Their troops were led out of camp and drawn up by tribes at regular intervals from each other. Arudes, Marcomani, Trivokis, 
Vangiones, Nemetes, Sedusi, Suebi. In the rear of their line, so that there should be no hope of running away, they made a barrier out of their carts and wagons, and here they placed their women, who stood there with hands outstretched and tears streaming from their eyes, imploring the men as they marched out to battle not to deliver them into Roman slavery. I placed each of my five senior officers in command of a legion and entrusted the remaining legion to my quaestor, so that each man might know that he was displaying his courage under the eyes of a high-ranking officer. I then began the action by leading our right wing into battle, since I had noticed that the enemy's left was the least steady part of his line. When the signal was given, our men rushed forward so fiercely, and the enemy came on so swiftly and furiously, that there was no time for hurling our javelins. They were thrown aside, and the fighting was with swords at close quarters. The Germans quickly adopted their usual close formation to defend themselves from the sword thrusts. But many of our men were brave enough to leap right on top of the wall of shields, tear the shields from the hands that held them, and stab down at the enemy from above. The German left was pushed back and routed, but their right, by sheer weight of numbers, pressed us hard. Young Publius Crassus, in command of the cavalry, saw what was happening, and being in a more maneuverable position than the officers engaged in the fighting, he ordered the third line forward to the relief of our troops who were in difficulty. The result was that the battle again swung our way, and the whole enemy army turned and ran. They fled without stopping until they came to the Rhine, about fifteen miles away. A very few, who thought their strength equal to the task, tried to swim across or managed to find boats, and so escaped. Among these was Ariovistus, who found a small craft moored to the bank and got away safely in it. All the rest were overtaken and killed by our cavalry. Ariovistus had two wives, both of whom were killed in the general rout. One of these was of Swabian nationality, and he had brought her with him from home. The other was the sister of King Vocio of Noricum, who had sent her to Gaul to be married. Of Ariovistus' two daughters, one was killed and one taken prisoner. Having joined in the pursuit with the cavalry, I came upon Gaius Valerius Procillus, who was being dragged off by his guards in the general rout, closely fettered with three chains. This meeting gave me as much pleasure as the victory itself. It was good to see this man, one of the best in the whole province and a great friend of mine, whose hospitality I had enjoyed, rescued from the enemy and restored to me. And it was good to think that, by preserving him safe and sound, Providence had done nothing to mar our feelings of joy and triumph. Perkillus told me that the Germans had three times consulted the lots in his presence as to whether he should be burned alive then and there, or reserved for another occasion. It was only thanks to the way the lots turned out that he was saved. Marcus Metius was also discovered and brought back to me. When the news of the battle reached the other side of the Rhine, the Suebi, who had advanced as far as the banks of the river, began to go home again. The tribes living in the Rhineland, seeing how frightened they were, turned on them and killed great numbers of them. So during one summer two great wars had been fought and won. I now led the army back into winter quarters among the Sequani rather earlier than the weather required. Leaving Labienus in command, I set off myself for Cisalpine Gaul to hold the Assizes.